Hello and welcome to tonight's salon. As part of our Big Ideas series, we're delighted to welcome Doc Dr. Pragya Agarwal. But first of all, I just want to say um, welcome to everyone who's here. A big thank you to our members and all of our community at Salon, Salon North and the Also Festival. My name is Juliette Russell. I'm one of the founders, the co-founders of um, Salon London and of the Also Festival. And if you're joining us for the first time, a huge welcome to you and thank you for joining tonight. You won't be disappointed. Um, so to talk a little bit about the structure tonight, so I'll give us a brief introduction to, about Pragya and her work. Um, then we'll do an in-conversation for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll hand over to you for audience questions. So you can ask your questions to Pragya. There's a chat function, which you should have got a link to when you're sent out the information for the event. Um, we've been trying to run these events for free or for donation throughout lockdown and throughout COVID pandemic. Um, because I think it's really important for people to be able to engage with the big ideas that are affecting our lives right now. But if you do want to buy a copy of the book, then we kindly ask you to buy it from us because we are also an independent bookseller and what a book it is. Um, so I'd just like to welcome our guest tonight, who's Dr. Pragya Agarwal. And Pragya is a behavioural and data scientist and also a freelance writer and journalist. Um, after gaining her PhD at Nottingham University, she was a senior academic at a number of universities in the UK and the US. And she was also held the prestigious Leverhulme Fellowship at Leeds University. She is the winner of the Diverse Wisdom Writing Award from Hay House Publishing, and that was in 2018. And she's also been named as one of the top 100 most influential women in social enterprise and one of 50 people creating change in the UK India corridor. As a freelance writer and journalist, Pragya has written numerous articles on bias and prejudice, on racial and gender equality, and on mental health for, for um, journals and uh, publications as wide as The Guardian, Forbes, British Medical Journal, The Independent, and Huffington Post. Pragya also runs her own podcast series, Outside the Boxes, which examines how labels and stereotypes affect us. She looks at the science behind this and what we can do about it. Her book, Sway, Unraveling Unconscious Bias is simply the clearest, most thorough exploration of unconscious bias that I have read. Um, please give a huge warm welcome to Dr. Pragya Agarwal. Pragya, welcome. It's so lovely to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me here, Juliet. It's been, it's a pleasure to be yes. here. I love the book. I mean, not only is it meticulously researched and brilliantly communicated, but um, look, obviously you dealt with huge subjects like um, racial and gender equality. But I was also really taken with the breadth of what you covered and, and biases I hadn't really even considered before. So it was so um, illuminating. Thank you. Um, but I wondered if we could just start with what your um, description or perception of unconscious bias is and why it is so important for us to understand it. Yes, thank you so much for reading it and for your lovely words. Um, I um, I wrote this book because I think um, when um, in the last few years, unconscious bias has become such a kind of a buzzword. And that was uh, one of my concerns that it was becoming like a trendy word rather than and there were lots of myths and misconceptions associated with it. Um, and I really wanted to delve deep into and do a kind of an interdisciplinary investigation of what it is. Um, and through my academic research, i had been looking at how bias and uncertainty shapes data and technology. So unconscious biases are the biases that we carry, uh, these implicit prejudices or stereotypes that we carry within us. And sometimes we are not aware of them, but our, our behavior is influenced by them. Our decisions, interactions, actions are affected by these biases that, that we carry. And so these are implicit attitudes or preferences or choices that we have. And uh, often, because we have so much information coming at us, sometimes we don't have the capacity or the cognitive ability to process all the information on a rational, logical way. So often we process information in a quite a hurried way, in a rushed way, um, especially when we are distracted or tired. And then we match these with these implicit kind of templates that, that are, we carry. And these are the unconscious biases that affect our decisions and our actions. Thank you, that's really clear. So there's a few things that I want to pick up on. So one thing that comes through very strongly in the book is the multidisciplinary approach, um, because you really combine neuroscience with psychology, with sociology, really, and, and history, too. Um, and I, I know right at the beginning of the book, you sort of examine the evolutionary context of bias and really explore 
the neuroscience um, associated with it, but it's a lot more complex than that. And I wondered if you could sort of take us through what you think is sort of innate and then what really what's serving us and what isn't serving us and what we can do about that. Yes, um, I really wanted to start there because uh, sometimes um, I think we see these bylines or headlines or it is it is said that we we are these some of these biases are ingrained in us or we, they are genetically design we are genetically more designed to be biased or prejudiced in this way or racist in uh, especially when it comes to racism and and i really wanted to explore deep into what evolutionary theories say about how why some of these implicit attitudes might be kind of are they really hardwired in us or are they learned through time um, and yes i mean some of the evolutionary theories that i looked at talk about how in the very very distant past our ancestors had to make really quick decisions about um, the people competing for these very limited resources and there was a very tribal sense where they had to make a decision about who is in part of the in group and who's part of the out group because these members could be bringing in diseases or illnesses that they didn't have immunity to or they could be competing for the, these limited resources as i said so these kind of primal instinct of forming these in group out group sense or divisions are kind of something that we all carry we still do that we do that on the basis of our confirmation biases or our affinity biases where we want to surround ourselves with people who are like us who look like us think like us and so 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 in the very distant distant past yes the, there were these instincts and i suppose we still have those instincts but what i really wanted to make it clear or really talk about is that Today, the modern contemporary society is not the same. We are not competing for those very, very limited resources. We have better immunity. We, we don't need to lay down these really hard lines of in-group and out-group. And, and we cannot make excuses or justify our actions by saying that these are hardwired within us or these we have these kind of primal instincts and we can't do anything about them. And as I talk through the book, I also talk about how these biases are learned over time, which means that we can unlearn these biases and prejudices as well. Um, so, so that's where I think it was really important for me to examine some of the evolutionary theories. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think there's something that came through the book, which is that these biases are neither sort of stable nor set. So mm -hmm. there are things that we can do about them, which is, is good to hear. And I suppose what's, there's a few things you said that, that have sort of sparked um, thoughts. And one is, that we tend to make uh, more fast decisions when we're under pressure, when we're tired, anxious, or um, maybe in an unfamiliar setting. So is there something between that sort of fast and slow thinking that we can adapt and how might we improve understanding that we have implicit biases, but not letting, not defaulting to those? Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to be as soon as we're aware that we're falling back on these implicit attitudes. So this is a this is a dual processing theory that I talk about in the book, where there's a system one thinking and there's a system two thinking. So system one thinking is, as I said, when we are especially um, really tired or distracted or hurrying, we, we want to make really quick decisions and all this information that's coming at us, we we fall back on our past experiences or memories. And they are, they are these templates that we carry that are based in these past experiences. And so we process that information purely on kind of a very superficial level in our brain without uh, any kind of rational, much rational or logical thinking. And we match these, it's kind of a visual matching game where they, we match them to these past memories and experiences and say, this is what happened in the past or these templates that exist in our brain. So this is how I'm going to base my decision upon. And so we are reducing the cognitive load that that would be would have to incur if we process all that information in a very slow, rational, logical manner. But then if we really take the time when, in, when we have to make really important decisions, then we can allow ourselves to send that information down to our cortex or prefrontal cortex where information can be processed in a more rational manner where we weigh up different options. Um, and I think another thing is that if we are aware that this is what we are doing, um, first of all, we can take time with some important decisions. We don't make them on our first instinct of gut instinct or first impressions, which is more likely to fall back on these templates. And secondly, 
we might carry these stereotypes or these templates, but there's a difference between carrying these stereotypes and activating these stereotypes. And once we become aware of that process that we are activating some of these stereotypes, then we can minimize that as well. So I think just being aware of that process and knowing when these stereotypes are activated or these biases might be activated can be quite helpful. That's great. And there's a couple of things. So we've got system one thinking, system two thinking. And I'm just wondering, there's something you said around memories that we have that we kind of base our decisions on things that have kind of been our previous experiences. Can we create new memories that then starts to override our system one thinking? Or is that something that is stable, but we can more override the system two thinking where we take our time and, and give a more informed process to our thinking? No, absolutely. None of these, this, I don't believe that these, any of these biases or templates are, are stable. Um, I think we're changing and evolving over time as we create new memories and we form new neural connections, as we form new associations between different bits of information. And I think that's why it's really so important to reflect on our own biases and stereotypes that we carry in kind of a non-judgmental way. And I think that's why for me writing this book was one way in which I wanted to let people just reading through the book um, help them to reflect mm -hmm. on some of their biases as well. Because then once we start doing that, we can start questioning any of these templates that we are carrying. Um, and so, for instance, if in the past, um, we, for instance, if if we make a decision or we make a, a, a biases might be that we, we, if people speak in a particular accent, then we have a particular association with it. And if we become aware of it, then we can, change it we can alter that and we can question that and we can acknowledge that and there are these different steps be aware of it questioning it acknowledging and and then starting to minimize the impact of these biases as well so i think that's a really lovely part of the book it's partly as we touched on at the beginning is the breadth of it and the fact that there were kind of things you hadn't like even things like accents the way you can judge someone on an accent and then maybe put them in a certain social caste or or class or or um a certain intellectual quality there's nothing to do with just where they grew up that's all it has to do with and making those judgments and that was something that it was quite, it's quite a um a surprising chapter in the book actually um there's also something that i was thinking about that you said um that was, that was a really important part of the book is i think the non-judgmental that if you can actually assess what your biases are you can recognize them and actually i think that's something the book does very successfully is make you question your own biases and then do better sort of in the future and sort of address them and then work with them. Um, and I think also then there's sometimes a fear around having open conversations. And there's something that I noticed you talked about in terms of how can we, if we've got, because if you're, you say we've got in groups and out groups and there's lots of binary thinking that I think has held us back for quite a long time. And how do you feel about the influence on binary thinking generally with sort of more of the spectrum or mosaic thinking that if, for example around um, gender and also how much do you think that technology takes us back to more binary thinking or uses this spectrum thinking so it's a bit of a big question there but... yes I think um, first of all I'm glad to hear that the book allows people or helps people do do it in a non-judgmental way because I think the problem with talking about bias is is sometimes that people get so defensive and nobody wants to acknowledge and accept that we carry any biases because we are all fair-minded and we are all uh, egalitarian. And Well, that's the goal, isn't it? That's what you want to be. And yes. um, but, but we are all biased. And I think through this book, book, I wanted to say I'm biased and so are you. And then some of these cognitive biases that we carry, we can reflect on them. Sometimes we might not be able to change much of that, but we can minimize its impact. Um, in terms of binary thinking, yes, I think gender really definitely suffers from from that. Um, and I, I and actually, in fact, I didn't um, have space to address that in so much detail in the book because there was the because of the breadth of the different biases that I wanted to talk about. Um, but in one of the episodes of Outside the Boxes, I talk about how now we are moving away from the whole gender binary because it's kind of rooted in. In, in the supremacist, supremacist ideals of how, how, how um, the notion of what a man is and what a woman is, these very rigid parameters were determined a while ago. And we are still, these are very Eurocentric ideals of what a woman is and what a man is that we are still carrying forward. And now research is showing us that actually it's, it's a spectrum. And they, these, these 
parameters are not as rigid as we assume them to be. And, uh, and I think, and I think a lot of our thinking is binary because it's easier to do that, this or, or uh, the other. And we, we tend to, we tend to fall back on these because it's more challenging to think about it in a spectrum sometimes, not just for gender, for other things as well. Um, and, and in terms of technology, um, yes, it's very deterministic and it's, it, it, the way the data is designed, it is very category based. It's, it is very, it, 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 the boundaries are very rigid. There's no a space for these kind of fuzzy boundaries, the vague uncertainties and the gray area, so to speak. And I think technology does enable or, or support this kind of very rigid um, categorization of objects. And I think that is that is easier for people to understand and this easier for people to manage in the world in this kind of by the, these kind of categories. So I think, and that's one something that I, I looked through my academic research as well for a long time about how data is set in these very rigid boundaries while the world is not like that. When we are making mental models of a of world, for instance, we are not setting really, really binary um, parameters. We're not setting these kind of really definite boundaries, these black and white associations. We are making sense of concepts in, and there are fuzzy boundaries to it, the way that our mind works. And so um, there is a lot that needs to be done in technology. There's a lot that needs to be done in data management and data science as well about how we represent the world around us without resorting to these, falling back on these uh, categorizations, rigid categorizations. But I think we need to change our mindset and the way of thinking as well, because I think the, the, it is, as I said, it's challenging to do that. And I think it, it creates a sense of discomfort for people because for a long time, people were set in these kind of binary parameters. And now if you step outside it, suddenly you get cognitive dissonance. You kind of don't understand how to manage the world around us. And I think, that that discomfort is something we need to sit with if we want to reflect on our biases and prejudices. Yeah, and it's interesting because as we start rethinking things, because as new information comes to light, we have to embrace this new information rather than think about things the way they've always been. And it's kind of embracing that understanding of complexity. And actually that's something that, um, there's a big chapter on technology in your book, which is really enlightening. Um, but there's something that I want to talk to you about with two things, really. One about there's some really interesting things around stereotyping and how even positive stereotyping can be so limiting for people. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and the, the danger of stereotyping and why that's so reductive and harmful. Yeah, so stereotypes are, are kind of homogenizing different groups. So putting a label on a group and saying, these are the property attributes to a particular group, no matter what the group membership is. In terms of race, you could say that black people are a certain way or brown people act a certain way. And, and it's even more reductive when we talk about like BME or people of color and the, everybody who's not white is lumped into this category and they're homogenized. What it does, it is very reductive as you say, because it, it's kind of dehumanizing the individuals. It's not taking individuals on their own merit, but you're saying, because you're part of this group, you need you will all have this particular attribute and so that's a stereotype and what it does is that when people judge people or meet people from these different groups or communities they are more likely to um, measure them against these stereotypes or these templates that you carry and so so they they are basically not judging or assessing they're making these kind of preconceived notions or decisions assessments about people based on these stereotypes which are perpetuated through media or books or anything that we look around us um, in terms of positive stereotypes, I think sometimes benevolent stereotypes are actually uh, used to counter some of these negative stereotypes. For example, I give an example of women are wonderful, the wow effect. Um, and, and that's often said women are really nurturing or women are really um, caring. And that's used a lot in kind of workplaces or organizations as well. But that creates these the, again, it's what it, it is doing is actually putting people into boxes and these labels. It's kind of restricting them. And by and we know from workplace um, uh, work and inclusivity and diversity work with them and in organizations that women face a double bind bias when it comes to leadership. So women are not seen as authoritative or assertive like 
men. So again, these kind of masculine and feminine qualities are imposed on people according to their gender, perceived gender. And then women are not given promotion or promoted to leadership positions because they are not seen as assertive or authoritative, but they're seen as caring and nurturing. And that's used kind of a benevolent stereotype against them. But as soon as a woman tries to break out of that box and, and break out of these kind of limiting feminine properties, again, that part, she's penalized because then she's seen as kind of not conforming to a feminine feminine ideal or not being cooperative or to not play, being a team leader. And then again, she's penalized. So this is a double bind bias. For instance, if you say, and research has also shown that often these kind of positive stereotypes, which are perceived as positive stereotypes also go hand in hand with some kind of negative notion. For instance, it has been shown that when the stereotype that black men are very athletic because we see them um, at Olympics and all these sporting events, it goes hand in hand with a stereotype that they are not as intellectually able perhaps. So their physical ability overrides their intellectual ability. So that is also a really negative thing. And again, I think if, if that also creates a lot of pressure on people to conform to these stereotypes, like Asians are very good at maths. So if a person succeeds or has does really well in maths, an Asian person, um, their, their, it, their achievement can be denigrated or dismissed because they obviously they are, uh, they are good at maths. So it, mm -hmm. it is not seen as an individual merit or it's kind of an individual achievement. So these positive stereotypes are again, people pushing people into these boxes and labels, no matter how they are sold as, you know. It's really interesting you picking up on that because I think there's a real danger. Let me talk about reductiveness earlier on. There's that homogeneity of seeing, mm -hmm. rather than seeing the diversity within groups that you may feel have commonality, that's a mistake we make all of the time is that kind of, that diversity and if you're in a sort of in group that tends to reflect you you don't have experience of diversity so therefore you're 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 I suppose you're you are reductive in your way and you're you're kind of homogenizing people which is so dangerous and I think what what's um interesting about that is I think we live in such a beautifully diverse society here in London I think that importance of representation and that importance of visibility and the importance of having multiple voices and multiple cultural inputs in your life and whatever that might be whether it's from you know people with disabilities people with different cultures people from different places um yeah the importance of that and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that like how can we counter some of these that our our, our kind of our instinct or our, our kind of habit to go to a kind of in group yeah hi um so yes uh, absolutely I think um it is very important to 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 keep our world very diverse, uh, to keep our reading very diverse, and we talk about that quite a lot in terms of how important it is. Representation really matters, and role mod models really matter, and we need to hear multiple voices and multiple um, experiences, um, but not just not just from kind of like a BME group or the black community or within the black community or within the brown community, within the Asian, South Asian community, we need to see more diversity within that as well. Um, so, so recently I organized a South a online South Asian literary festival and the whole aim was that we wanted, I wanted to show that there's not just one story because as we talk about even a South Asian writer, sometimes people can be pushed into a box mm. that you'll be you'll be writing about your identity or trauma or or when you talk about India there is one particular story um, or Indian subcontinent so I think it's really important to show that there is not just one story within these groups as well even mm. as we talk about representation and, and um, in media or within sometimes what can happen is that again we are falling back on kind of a white gaze so these people people are given opportunity but again only what is palatable to a majority mm. white audience, you know? So we talk about how we don't have, we didn't have any black woman on the cover of the Vogue or Vogue magazine. And I, I talk about the stats in the book. And then even though there were some black women, they were the really fair skinned ones because that was more kind of palatable or kind of acceptable um, part of the black community. Um, and so I, I think, and as we talk about diversifying our reading, like stepping outside our echo chambers, still we, we find that it's the same books that are talked about, it's the same authors that are talked about. And often we 
fall back on these books and which are which are written by minority ethnic writers and that's really great but but the similar kind of stories about about poverty or about oppression about about mm -hmm. having a forced marriage or you know so again still it's creating a stereotype you're not still seeing the richness of stories within this and i think maybe it's also the case that they don't get published they don't get uh, as much of a platform as some other stories which which are still kind of stereotypical in some way so <laughs> i don't know if that answers your question but no it does actually and i think that's a really huge thing that comes out in the book is what's considered to be normative and then everything else is kind of othered as a res as a respect for being normative and there's one sort of quite funny part in the book where um the women's kind of uh, women are pe being perceived to be more competent. It used to be something like 37% competence in 1988. And now in 2016, we're judged to be 86% competent, which is great that we've got more competent in that time, but equally, we're still not as competent as men. And that's the standard by which we're being judged. And there's lots of examples like that in the book that are kind of the normative and what we perceive to be normative. And it's often historical and not necessarily relevant or serving us at all now, um, which reminds me actually of, a big part of the book is where you talk about intersectionality and I wonder if you can talk to us about that and what that means and what the implications of that are and the complexity of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, for me, I think it's really, really important that we talk about intersectionality when we're talking biases and prejudices and oppression, because even as we talk about racism um, or sexism, um, we, we need to understand that when that all of us belong to, have multiple identities and when these multiple identities intersect some of these biases can be heightened so i give example for instance when we talk about a black man or a black woman a black woman be, uh, is black so but also a woman so there are these two different identities which intersect and which can heighten the bias against them or the kind of nature of bias that is or the oppression that they might face would be very different can be very different to a black man um, because of the, the their membership of different identities so intersectionality is a is is a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw professor Crenshaw who, uh, a little while ago to talk about how our our belonging or our membership in different groups can actually heighten the bias or change the nature of the bias and I think that's really really important for us to understand so when we talk about feminism we have to we have to understand that white women the the kind of sexism they face would be different from women of color because they also have the added bias of racism associated with it and that's why when we talk about gender pay gap we also have to consider ethnicity pay gap because the, the uh, we've seen through research that minority ethnic community gets paid much less than their white counterparts. Um, and, and we talk about disability, but they can be different identities. So disability, sexuality, all those things are really important to consider. And I think that's kind of a related point to that is, is the privileges that we carry. And that's why we need to be really conscious and, and aware of our, the privileges that each of us have, which we don't reflect on, because our privileges determine the kind of biases or ob obstructions or barriers we might face in our lives that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that we 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 um we haven't like if we, we talk about white privilege for instance and that doesn't mean that white people haven't faced any barriers or obstructions it just means that they haven't faced the barrier of racism in their lives mm. for instance they can be other obstructions like class or, or uh, caste or uh, other accents, or as we talk about other forms of bias or disability or sexuality. And so I think that is that is why it's really this notion of privilege and is really important or integral to understanding this, this notion of how intersectionality works as well. And sometimes there can be some criticism of intersectionality because it can create, it's, it's often, the critique says that it's like an oppression Olympics that you're pitching different categories against each other. But I don't see it like that. I personally think that it's really important for us to understand how bias can be heightened just because people belong to different multiple groups at the same time. Yeah, and understanding that. Yeah, and I think there, there is, yeah, to differentiate and kind of individualize experience as well is really important. And thank you for clarifying, because I think, um, 
for really giving a brilliant definition of privilege there. I think that's really, really helpful. Um, just to quickly talk to our lovely audience, um, I did put my phone number in because I wasn't sure the comments section was working, so I wanted to make sure that it is. So please do send your questions in because um, put this is a brilliant opportunity for you to engage it with Pragya and to get some answers to things that might bother you. You might be have something at work that you want to improve on in, within your organisation. Please do ask her. She's got some fantastic ideas in her book about things like that. Um, one of the probably the most harrowing chapters in your book is around um, the judicial system and health system when actually our biases or people's biases can be literally a matter of life and death. And I wondered if you could just talk about that, because I think when we think about um, the enormity of really that bias and prejudice can have, it can have a devastating effect on people. And I wouldn't mind if you could just open that up a little bit more for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, as we are seeing with what happened recently with George Floyd's murder and with and then the protest protests that happened after that, what we saw how uh, how some of these biases are, are can result in 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 uh, um, in a death of a person, um, and and I think here I think it's really important for me to also talk a little bit about the difference between institutional and interpersonal kind of racism and these biases as well. So while I talk about unconscious bias or the biases that we carry, these individual biases and prejudices, sometimes people can talk, dismiss unconscious bias as, as that it's, it's, actually, um, it's actually ignoring the systemic and structural prejudices or racism that exists in our society. But what I say is that we are part of the system and we, we all have a role to play. And I think it's a loop that, for instance, we saw in the police, when we see, look at the legal system or the police, for instance, or the medical healthcare professionals, they're all part of the system. So while there is institutional racism or institutional sexism or, or these prejudices that affect people's life and the, the diagnosis treatment or in the incarceration or their, um, how they are, uh, the, the trial results in whether they are convicted or not, um, there is a structural uh, aspect to it. There's also these individual and interpersonal um, biases and prejudices that come into play where people fall back easily on the stereotypes they have. And these stereotypes have been perpetuated by these institutional uh, prejudices and these frameworks. And so, but our individual biases feed back into the indiv institutional ones as well. So I think that they, that's a loop that we shouldn't really dismiss um, our accountability and responsibilities individuals in, in the institutional um, structural barriers that people face of different groups. Um, in terms of legal and um, we in police, we know that, um, for instance, um, black men are considered more aggressive and threatening. And there's a lot of research to show that. One of the research case studies that I have in the book is from a virtual simulation platform where police officers were shown images of white and black men walking through just a normal like a shopping mall or something with an object in the hand, some innocuous object. And these police officers had to make a decision about whether it was a gun or just any other object. And they had to press a button really, really quickly. So it, it's again, because they would have to make this decision really quickly, they were falling back on their kind of instinctive stereotypes that they had. They had to make a really quick decision about whether it was a gun and they had to press shoot or don't shoot. And, and the results were staggering, although not that surprising in a way, because it mm. showed that there was a high, very high likelihood of an error. Um, and police officers were more likely to press shoot when they saw a black man, even when they were not carrying a gun. And so that really shows that these stereotypes of that black men are more they, they are more involved in criminal offenses or they are more in, they are more likely to be aggressive and threatening result in more incarcerations result in more shootings against the, against black men and we talk about black we don't talk that much about black women and i recently wrote another article about where we talked about Breonna Taylor and how it, that is not getting enough attention mm -hmm. is because black women are seen as angry and these angry black women trope that result that exists in a society. And uh, that is used as well. And we see in medical and healthcare professionals, black women die more in maternity mm -hmm. um, and in childbirth. Um, and they are less likely to be given um, the correct diagnosis and treatment. And I have a number of case studies in the book. So yes, I think that these kind of institutional, there is an institutional issue, there is a structural issue, there's, which results from the legacy and history of oppression, but that results in these individual biases, which, which can affect people's decisions, especially, 
and that becomes a matter of life or death, especially in some of these contexts. Yeah, and there's no doubt that colonialism has left a kind of a horrific legacy in that respect. I think that we're kind of really at a crux of now that we have to we have to kind of really sort it out as a society. It's kind of um, but the what the thing I want to say because obviously as an institution, how do you change an institution? Obviously, it's made up of individuals, and and we're all part of that. So any institutions that we're in, or any organisations that we're in we can take that on board and need to challenge those things. But how can that change? Like what can be done to really reduce those sort of judicial and health inequities? Yeah, I think it's a really big question. And, um, and I think it has to come from a policy level. And I think, first of all, there has to be an acknowledgement that this exists, these housing discrimination, discrimination in employment, all these things exist. Um, and we I have numerous case studies in the book and data to show that it, it it does, it does affect people's lives. Um, and I think it has to be a policy level thing. And um, these policies, we need to examine the policies, we need to uh, really carefully um, see how we can create a position of equity because we keep talking about equality, but we can't have equality until people start from the same place. And that has to be an equity um, level. And that might mean that we give people um, more opportunities who have traditionally been marginalized. That means that maybe positive discrimination has to take place. That means that we need to create more opportunities and re remove some of these barriers from people. Um, um, that, and that means that maybe, yeah, I mean, it has to happen from a micro level and a macro level both. I, I, I personally think that. I think we can't do either or. We can't just say mm. we address in individual biases and ignore the whole large scale, bigger picture issues that exist at policy level. Mm. Or we can not just address the policy levels and ignore the individual and interpersonal biases that sometimes result in microaggressions that affect people's health, men mental and physical health so much. So I think it has to be a, a two way process both at the micro and a macro level yeah and I think addressing it at both levels makes it more um achievable because sometimes if a, if it seems that systemic is such a monolithic view that how can you change an institution that especially if you don't work for it you have nothing to do with it but actually both like changing at a policy level maybe interacting with policy through your MP and win whatever way you can and changing it on a micro level is a good way to look at it because obviously organizations are made up of people institutions are made up of people and politics is made up of people so is that sort of individual responsibility within that as well as kind of challenging things on more of a as more of a movement i suppose which is really helpful thank you so much um we've got some questions Pragya. are you happy to go to questions absolutely yes great um so we have one from lorraine thank you lorraine and what she's asking is when you've dealt with your biases when you're exploring your biases are we at risk about of coming emotionally neutralized and therefore running the risk of being confused with how to define identity? Um, I'm trying to understand the question. Um, does that mean that? I think possibly the question is that when you deal with your biases, do you become less, does your identity change? Maybe there's something around that when you're, come to terms with bias if you're does that change if you've got if you're part of your own in group does that change identity I don't know if that's what she's definitely trying to say yeah. but I think uh, perhaps but our identity shouldn't be based in our identities shouldn't be based in our biases against mm. people so we can have a group membership as an identity but that doesn't always necessarily have to result in a bias or prejudice against people who are not part of a group so I might be that I belong to, uh, I feel very strong associations with other people because they, we are all support the same football team or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's part of my identity. I don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to make it clear, yeah. my husband's listening, but, <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean that I have to discriminate against people who do not support the same football team, you know? So that outgroup bias or prejudice doesn't have to define my identity. That they, those are not interlinked. So if, if I am, for instance, 
uh, involved in making a hiring decision and I make the decision based on whether this person supports the same football team or not, then that is a discriminatory attitude. That's, that's prejudice, that's bias. Or if I'm looking at a CV and thinking this person's more capable because unconsciously I think that subconsciously I think that they went to the same university as me or came come from the same hometown, then that's a bias or discriminatory attitude towards somebody who's not gone to the same university. So our identities don't have to link to the biases with people who do not belong to the same groups. If that, yeah. yeah, and I'm wondering, leading on to that, yeah, that does make perfect sense. That's really helpful. But I think when we're establishing relationships with people, we're establishing commonality, but that commonality can be anything, can't it? Yeah. Between humans. It's, I suppose it's establishing commonality in every se every setting that we're in. It's, it's, you know, those shared goals, those shared interests and all of those things. Absolutely. But that isn't always, that doesn't really, or some of these commonalities are really crucial to our identity, but some of these commonalities are not crucial to our identity. And they're just there to, to maybe be form a harmonious kind of uh, acquaintance or something. Um, yeah, so I think, our, I think that's an interesting question because I think we have to be very, very kind of um, strong about our own identities. And I think that's why when we do this work with children, especially as they're growing up, it's so important for them to be so clear and, and really comfortable with their own identities because they're going to face some of these biases as well in their lives, mm. or they, they might be in a position to inflict some of these biases and stereotypes. So I think that's why this work of working on our identity has to start from a young age as well. Yeah, and that's actually something that's your next piece of work, isn't it? To, is to create a kind of handbook or manual for parents to talk to their children about bias. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yes, so this is a book that's coming out in, on 15th of October. It's, um, it's for parents and carers, educators, grandparents, aunts, uncles, anybody who's, who's close to a child um, of all ethnicities, not just for white parents, um, about how to really grow children who are really comfortable with their racial identity, with identity, especially like I have children who are multi-heritage, dual heritage, biracial, so to say. And I think that can become very complex as well. Um, and I talk about it in, in terms of from the ages of, from birth to 12 years really, because I think those are the very crucial years when these stereotypes are forming and they, they become really deeply entrenched. So th th that's the time when we have to really work on them. And the book is called Wish We Knew What to Say because it's based around questions that children might ask and that parents feel uncomfortable answering and why parents feel uncomfortable talking about race and racism when th that is a really integral thing or topic that we really want should talk to our children about um yeah so it's it's uh, it's written in a very accessible manner and it's coming out on the 15th of october it's available now to pre-order wonderful that's that'll be, i think it's very useful to have a handbook for people because i think a lot of people are searching for ways to do better um which we'll come back to actually but i've got another question which is um from sylvia hello sylvia um how can you reverse unconscious prejudice um, is it learnt behaviour? And she says, thank you for writing such an important book. How can we reverse it? Um, I, I think we can minimise it, certainly. And um, all that we talked about, about reflection, acknowledging, this whole process of de-biasing has to happen, where we become aware of some of these biases. For instance, I give an example about uh, just a normal example about my child speaking in a Liverpool accent and me suddenly realizing that I have certain biases associated or prejudices associated with this accent and I had to really reflect on that and so so this work has to I think been ongoing it's a very continuing work because over our, over our lives we form so many of these biases and prejudices and we, these are sometimes shortcuts because we need these shortcuts to make information uh, decisions and and we some of these can be as we talk about can be a matter of life and death for people as well, or can reflect on our very important decisions. So I think this work has to continue all the time. We have to really step back and reflect on how we think about other people. Do we lump them into categories? Do, they, do we homogenize them? Do we have certain uh, prejudices associated with people because of their group memberships? And as, as we start becoming aware of them, we, we can, start minimizing them because then we are de-biasing ourselves um, slowly and and then and then also as I said there is a step between 
holding a stereotype and activating a stereotype. So then we can be also become aware of when we are activating a stereotype and, and we become more conscious of our decisions and actions. And it's, it's a slow ongoing process, of course, but, but it can happen, certainly. And I think embracing that is actually a really lovely way to look at that is kind of getting familiar with your biases, understanding when you can then not act on them when you understand them. And also that whole, I love the idea that it's an ongoing process because as your life, you evolve in all kinds of ways, like intellectually, spiritually, emotionally. Why would you not evolve in this way too? Because, you know, new, as new information comes to light or your experiences increase, why would you not then update your decisions just because they're, the ones you used to hold and also I think that's a, a good kind of metaphor for our lives generally is that kind of like shedding old skins and things that don't serve us and I think we're at a really important point where we need to look at what's really not serving us and how can we do better so that everyone in our society feels valued and integral to it because we all are integral and valued really and it's finding ways of making that um, work better while it's acknowledging that you're human and might get it wrong at times and yeah, um, having more honest conversations, really. Yeah, absolutely. Making mistakes is part of that as well. Um, and we all make mistakes. And I think we, what we're seeing with the whole Black Lives Matter is that people are suddenly becoming really panicky about whether I'm getting something wrong, whether I'm saying the wrong thing, whether I'm especially white people who've had to suddenly acknowledge privilege that they've held in terms of racism. And, and I think what I say is that Part of debiasing is also, as I said before, acknowledging our privileges, no matter which group membership that we fall back in, acknowledging our privileges and thinking about how can be I, I be a better ally to people who don't have the same privileges. And I mm. think that's part of the work as well of being a ally, good ally and actually being actively anti-bias or anti-racism or anti-sexism and doing that work rather than, and that's the next step after that as well. I think that's a really important thing because I think ally, allyship is a term that's used and is a very helpful term. But equally, what would you define as the difference between being like um, not feeling like you're racist or not wanting to be racist and being anti-racist? What is kind of being active in that process? Yeah, I think that there is a step further from that. So not being racist is that you're sitting uh, in your comfort, still in your comfort zone and you're saying, okay, I'm not going to do anything that's racist. I'm going to acknowledge any biases that I have. I'm not going to discriminate against somebody because of their skin color. Um, I'm going to acknowledge my white privilege and all those things. But am I actually moving one step forward and actually supporting those who have been marginalized? Am mm -hmm. I um, giving them a nudge because of my privilege? Because what, how, am I going, how am I going to leverage my privilege to make a difference to people who don't have the same privileges? I think that's really what anti-racist is, that you are actively standing up and speaking up about it. Being a good ally is also not demonizing people, not putting labels on them, um, speaking up if you see any injustice, um, supporting people who are facing any injustice or mar being marginalized. And, 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 and that can be an uncomfortable process sometimes because again and again, you're acknowledging your pri privilege in that position. And I think sometimes that work doesn't happen because people are so reluctant to acknowledge their privileges, acknowledge their position, their status quo. And I think people get worried that if we give some space to others who haven't had space or who have been marginalized, maybe we will lose our privilege or our position in the society or our, the, or our opportunities. But I think what as an ally, we also have to understand that by creating space for others, we are just giving, we are creating an equitable and more harmonious society and a healthier and happier society rather than losing any of our position or our opportunities so that's allyship as well I think personally. yeah that thank you so much Pragya that's that's wonderful yeah and that actually relates to one of our questions and something in the book that that chimes with because I know you said that that getting used to speaking out because it can be you can feel quite fearful speaking out and we've got a question from Claire thank you Claire um which is about if you want to make changes in the workplace without alienating sort of changing the culture of a workplace. How do you do that working alongside other people? What would you advise people to do if you want to kind of create a more diverse environment? And I hear what you're saying about, you know, creating a more harmonious society is obviously in absolutely everyone's interest. And I love that metaphor of giving space because 
it's not taking away from anyone else to give someone else space. Like we're all entitled to have space. We're all entitled to, to have that. And actually what we get is a more expensive world to live in. So could you talk a little bit about that for Claire's question? Yes, in terms of workplace. So I've been working with a lot of organizations um, for the last few years in terms of this. And I think what, what is really important, again, it's an ongoing process and changing a workplace culture takes time. And that has to involve the leadership as well. Um, often what I see in workplace is that you have uh, a small group of people who want to create change, um, like an EDI committee or something like that. They form this group. Um, they all sometimes have funds or kind of space from the leadership because everybody wants to take the diversity box. And, and often the minority ethnic people community has to take the initiative because they are the ones who have to educate everybody and the onus falls back on them. But as a white person, I think you have more leverage because you, you wouldn't be seen as, again, kind of a serving a self-interest if you're talking about racism, for instance, or even, you know, that, that can happen sometimes in minority ethnic communities. Um, I think involving a bigger group in this conversation and discussion is important, sending them resources, distributing and disseminating resources and case studies that show that actually these things matter. And then having a, a, a open conversation about how people feel in the workplace because and that can be an anonymous kind of reporting in terms of how people feel because these microaggressions sometimes become part of the workplace culture where people don't feel like they belong, like they, they don't feel, they feel othered and they, they don't feel happy and they don't feel like they, they, their mental health suffers as well. So I think that sense of belonging is really important. And if you can do that, that involving the leadership or the board is really important because I think they are the ones who are making the decision and they, it, and, and any change that has happened, has to happen in the workplace has to be kind of both short term and long term and it has to reflect in the values and ethos of an organization so the policymakers have to be involved in, in this kind of work so i think um you need to think about short term and long term steps that or strat strategies that can work so involving people in a conversation creating a platform where people can submit their responses to what is um, so how, how, what their sense of belonging is, what their experience in the workplace is that, as I said, that can be an anonymous reporting. And, and then using that as a kind of a stepping up point as well. So it's not easy to just like say right now within the space about what changes can happen, but I hope that helps in some way. I think it does because I think it gives multiple routes to achieving that and kind of gives a kind of almost a holistic look at the organization as well as what one person's um contribution to that can be so that's really really helpful thank you so much and Pragya thank you so much for this evening your book is wonderful I've learned so much from it and I feel like I've learned so much from this conversation too um and thank you yeah congratulations Pragya's book is available from us um it's a wonderful book and I love the fact that you're you really deal with the complexity of bias um with also the humanity of it and it is a non-judgmental book but it also is while not, while not necessarily, um, it's not a pessimistic book, but it does give you the reality of it, but it equally does give you the ability to understand how you can do better and how we as a society and a community can do better. So thank you so much for writing it and for spending your evening with us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Julia. Thank you. So if you stay online, I'm just going to say goodbye to everyone else and I'll speak to you in just a moment. And thank you to all of you for joining us for our Big Ideas series. We've got lots of other good things coming up. So head over to salon-london.com to find out what else we're up to. And we will be running our Also Festival as a small Also so Social at the end of July on the bank holiday weekend. Um, thank you so much for tuning in um, and have a lovely rest of your weekend and we'll see you soon. The salon is now closed. Hold on. Great.